Our final person here is Tara Wong, who's the uh, principal architect at Stone's Throw uh, Architecture. And at the fourth big, we've worked a lot with Tara since building great houses. Um, Tara was the national award winner for the, I always want to get this right, the National Architect Sustainable House Award in 2006. And if you've been to uh, the Courtright Center, you might have seen the house that she designed that won the award for, I guess, greenest, best house. Well, it was a, comp a national competition for building affordable housing that's also energy efficient. Yes. And uh, so works in Muskoka and in the GTA and all over Ontario, I guess. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Um, this presentation today, you probably heard a little bit in different ways from the tester and the builder, and now you're going to hear an architect's perspective. So hopefully one of these three ways of take, saying exactly the same thing, it'll hit home. So I apologize for any repetition. I know there's at least one repeated slide. Okay, so a homeowner's guide to energy resilient housing. I try to use as few um, units, and so this is the only one that's got any, just to explain what passive house is, but everyone's already explained it. So the 15 kilowatt hours rep represents in the heating, the hair dryer, right? So um, the average home in 2007, I got it from this is probably the same thing that everyone else has been reading. It's about 200 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. And then the air tightness, we already talked about that, that's 0.6 a little, and the average right now is four. And primary energy, this is the most important one, I think, and I think people forget it, because passive house is this idea of meeting these great standards, you have to meet them all. But in the end of the day, it's the amount of energy that we use that's really the most important thing. So you're only allowed 120 kilowatt hours per meter squared, and that's sort of, if you're using electricity, you get dinged because half of it's wasted. And if you're using a different kind of energy, it's dinged. So just try and keep it as low as possible. And there's no requirement in our building code that I know of um, that says that there's a maximum amount of energy that you're allowed to use. So passive house can be broken down into five really quick things. So if you're going to be in passive house, of course, the insulation is the most important. And it's going to be about twice as much as what the code requires. Windows, you're going to have to have triple glazed windows, insulated frames um, to meet passive house or even to go in that direction. And we already talked about this to other people saying just have a really airtight house. Um, and then once it's airtight, everyone goes, oh, but you can't breathe and it doesn't, you're going to just, you need to have good ventilation, fresh air that's coming in that's preheated before it comes in uh, by the heat that's already in the house. And then zero thermal bridges, and we've talked a little bit about thermal bridges, and I have some great pictures to try and explain this in a, in a pretty easy way. So those are the last slides that have actually any words on them. Okay, so insulation. Oh, did I tell you I build with weird building materials like straw bale and rent dirt and things like that. So this house here, it doesn't matter what your insulation is, as long as it has a good R value. So this house here just shows um, the structure on the inside of the house. And this is a house I did with the fourth pig in downtown Toronto. And it's wrapped on the outside with the insulation. And whether that insulation is spray foam or it's rock saw or it's the cotton bat or it's straw bale, just having it on the outside makes life with Passive House a lot easier. Oh, there's the red line. Uh -huh. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I did a little graphics there. Woohoo! So there's my little red line showing you that the air barrier or the insulation has to wrap around the whole house. So in this house, the insulation on the underneath the slab of the building, because the first floor, um, that little, oh, I have, apparently I have a pointer. But anyway, the, <laughs> the uh, slab on this thing is insulated with probably about two feet of perlite insulation agricultural grade perlite, really cheap. So it doesn't matter whether it's foam or perlite or straw, it's going to do the same thing as long as you know how to use the material. And here's another view of different types of insulation. So the house on the left is a rammed earth house, so a different one where you take soil and you put it in formwork and you turn it back into stone. And you can see the yellow line going through the building from the slab at the bottom all the way through to the top, you have a continuous layer of insulation the whole way through. And that's what stops 
everything there's not there's no studs in the way there's nothing in the way it's continuous all the way through and underneath the slab and the other house is a picture of my neighbor's house the far far right there that's their glowing heat loss and then the little blue one right beside it there's a garage you can kind of see and there's some reflection on my husband's car you can't tell the difference between the garage below and the bathroom above except for where the windows are which are passive house windows but you can see there's a big difference when you take infrared photography of houses um, after you've insulated if they're done well. So I would say the one on the far right is sort of your average older home and then my house which is about 75 percent more efficient. And then this is the windows, the triple glaze, what they look like. Not only are they triple glaze, because did you know that in North America if you go to Pella or any other sort of basic window store, they're selling you windows for Florida. And so if you don't know anything about windows, they're going to sell you the wrong ones because there are more North Americans in warmer climates than there are in cooler climates. So it's easy, unless you ask, you're going to get Florida windows. So a passive house window, not only is it the, the glass insulated, but the frames, which is 30% of the heat loss. Remember those thermal bridges we were talking about? The frame of the window is that thermal bridge that lets that cold into the house. So 30%, you're spending a lot of money on triple glazing and then you cheap out on the frames, you've just wasted all your money. So some of the passive house windows that we used on the straw bale house, that's after the straw is covered <laughs> on the left. <laughs> it's a little bit weird doing it this way. Um, those are triple glazed windows with thermally broken frames. And you can see, I mean, that light comes in and it's beautiful and it makes the house worth living in. Oh, windows are the best, spend your money on windows. And here's a great picture that I got. The house in the middle has passive house windows. <laughs> and the house on, houses on either side haven't been insulated and don't. So it's really nice. I find that infrared photography really helpful to see the differences between these buildings. Oh, and this is my house. This is the air tightness. <laughs> so they're both bad winters, um, but before we had air sealed and taken in uh, any insulation onto the house, you know, you'd lose uh, at the top of the roof, you'll see that it's bare because the heat's lost from the house. And what will happen is the sun will hit the roof and air loss from inside will create the damming and all the icicles. So you can tell if a house is poorly insulated and poorly air sealed because it has these. My son, who's nine, points at houses and goes, they have to air seal. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. so my house would be the only one on the street all winter long with snow on it. You'll have all the rest of the houses will be, you can see their shingles, but mine you can't. So I'm very proud of my snowy roof, um, but no um, icicles on my house. And that's the, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the other two presentations, that air tightness is about durability, and this is sort of the visual proof of that. Uh, one of our favorite, Joe Sturbeck, of course, we talked about him earlier, so I brought this slide in from him, he's Dr. Joe, talks about, basically the slide just says that air leakage is the number one cause of moisture getting into your building. So if you can stop the air leakage, it's not diffusion and it's not bulk transport, it's just holes in your building creating because the moisture moves 90 percent of the time with the air and we saw this one earlier so i'm just gonna go over this one <laughs> and here's some pictures of um, some of those passive house windows for cross ventilation and that's um, a 94 percent efficient um, ERV. It's not a very big thing. They've got lots of different kinds now, but a fully dedicated ventilation system is really important for a house. Um, although I'm really interested in, there's this really cool thing that's available now, the Lunos, you know that? It's a it's non-ducted ventilation system. I think that's going to be a, a great thing in the future. Here's thermal, my thermal bridge picture. This is a, quite a, a new building in uh, Chicago. And all the balconies all stick out, and it looks really sexy. Architects really love it. And then you take an infrared photography of it, and the uh, fins come out of the building, and you can see how much heat is leaving the building. Um, and some of the things that we do in thermal bridge-free construction, these are pictures of rammed earth houses. And you can see how the insulation goes around the corner. And on the far right one, 
it's the insulation coming down the building, but that's where the footing is, and the footing actually has insulation, so it's split in two as well. So there's no stop from the top to the bottom. And we think about that in any type of material that we use. Um, and passive house, a lot of people say, oh, it's too expensive to go to passive house. It's just too far, too much insulation, not in my climate, can't do it here. I say, is it a path or is it a destination? And I think if we start with it as a path and it makes sense economically to go to the final destination, then we do it. And if it doesn't, the path is going to lead us in the right direction. So that at the end of the day, whether you're 85% of the way there or 75% of the way there, you're already half um, the cost in terms of your monthly um, expenditure on energy than it, and more comfortable than anything you could build to code. So here's some just pictures of houses that I've done. Um, this is my own house. Just showing that passive house doesn't have a style necessarily and it, can, it has big windows and things like that, but there's no sense of, of um, that it has to be a certain way. Uh, and this, this picture here is of the straw bale. These are straw bale buildings. So the first one on the left is a straw bale cottage. The whole thing was wrapped on the outside. The center one is the straw bale house in downtown Toronto. And then the third one is also a picture from inside of that. So, and these are three outsides of houses. So modern, heritage, retrofit, it doesn't matter. Passive house is possible. And not all of these houses face south. Um, so one of the things many of my clients ask, can I build my house to passive house? I have a client now in... Um, Georgian Bay, and they're looking north at the view of Georgian Bay. So I told them up front, no, you can't have a passive house. So I designed them a house that if it faced south would be passive house, and if it faces north is about 50 kilowatt hours per meter squared. So if the average is 200, I think we're still doing okay. So I think that's what I'm talking about with path or destination. And I was the shortest here, so because it's late in the evening, so I'm going to say thank you very much. Thank you.